say a bit about the data I'm collecting. For my PhD dissertation, I'm building a data set that covers the 28 sub-districts in Syria that have been governed by IS uh, for a period of at least three months, um, since July of 2013, which is when the uh, group control substantial territory were first revealed in the 6th century is impossible to sustain in the face of 21st century policy challenges that could not have been anticipated at the time of the Prophet. So in order to regulate modern day problems such as traffic and social media, IS has needed to develop uh, an Islamic legal justification for the creation of new rules and policies that do not have an explicit basis in the Quran. So, like many modern states um, based on Islamic law, including Saudi Arabia, IS has embraced uh, the doctrine of siyasa sharia, which translates loosely as religiously legitimate governance. Um, this doctrine uh, basically allows state authorities to issue law-like rules um, for matters not explicitly addressed in the Quran, um, so long as these laws are designed to serve the public interest um, and do not contradict any of the established rules of sharia. So um, this is how we uh, get, for example, IS rules on traffic safety and automobile emissions. Um, consistent then with this doctrine of siyasa sharia, IS issues rules to regulate virtually every area of social, political, and economic life in its so-called caliphate. And uh, I won't uh, discuss everything on this list, um, but just want to point out some of the more known regulations. First, on uh, criminal justice, um, crimes and misconduct that are punished by IS uh, can be classified into roughly three categories. First, um, there are crimes threatening the state and public order, um, and this includes things like espionage, treason, uh, embezzlement of, or embezzlement of public funds. Second, um, we have crimes against religion or public morality, um, and, and these would include things like adultery, blasphemy, pornography, drugs and alcohol, and even witchcraft. Um, third, uh, we have crimes or torts against individuals, uh, and, and this would include things like theft, burglary, uh, murder, and assault. So this table here shows a sample of 279 criminal punishments uh, imposed by IS courts or police on Iraqi and Syrian civilians since 2013, which is drawn from a recent paper on this subject that I wrote for Brookings, if you're interested in more um, material. Um, and so while I don't claim that this sample is perfectly representative, I do think it's noteworthy that we see such a heavy emphasis on the prosecution of theft, with um, 51 cases over there on the far left um, uh, side of the bar graph. Uh, and um, I'll talk a little bit later on about how IS has benefited um, from its heavy emphasis on crime control in the areas that it captures. Uh, now, uh, moving to the last item on the list, I also want to say a word about IS's doctrines on military justice and laws of war. IS has a variety of rules to regulate the behavior um, of its own fighters, such as prohibiting them from writing about sensitive military operations on Twitter or Facebook, um, and also um, rules to regulate their treatment of civilians, enemy combatants, uh, and prisoners. So for example, IS has issued a 136-page manual of guidelines for the treatment of en enemy prisoners of war that specifies limits on things like torture, which is sometimes but not always um, permissible depending on the circumstances. Um, so then to enforce these rules, IS embeds jurists, known as shabbies, in combat units, um, and these jurists are then responsible for advising military commanders um, on the legality of particular operations and targeting um, decisions. So um, I've been told by IS defectors that commanding officers actually um, have to meet with uh, their units Shabi the evening before a new operation. Um, and Shabi basically needs to sign off on the battle plan um, and approve its legality according to IS's interpretation of Sharia um, before fighting can begin. So um, according to IS, it never uses violence uh, randomly or arbitrarily, but only when it is authorized by law. Um, and this shouldn't be surprising because as we know from classic works of political theory, all states need law to legitimize their monopolies on violence. Um, and IS as a de facto state, um, in my opinion, is really no exception to that rule. Moving uh, on now to the institutions that IS uses uh, to enforce its rules, IS has established courts and police forces in Syria, Iraq, in Libya, um, and proto courts are also um, reportedly operating in North Sinai as well as areas of Lebanon that border Syria. Uh, this chart is my own attempt to illustrate the structure of the IS legal system um, based on uh, interviews with people who have personally experienced that system. Um, and so I don't have time to discuss the entire chart. Uh, I just do want to say a bit about the court system um, in the lower left hand corner um, there, which is circled in red. IS actually has at least three different types of courts um, with different jurisdictions, um, and in some cases even an appeals process. So this is a fairly complex um, judicial system. 
So um, first there are um, the Islamic courts that handle criminal cases and matters related to the violation of major laws and policies. Second, there are courts known as Hizba Diwans that deal with complaints referred by the religious police. Um, and third, we have the um, complaints, co complaints courts, or Dawawin and Mazalim, uh, where civilians can file complaints against IS soldiers, rival armed groups, or other civilians, and request monetary compensation. Um, IS advertises uh, these complaints procedures and even made a video about a case in Mosul where the local IS um, uh, complaints court paid out 10 million Iraqi dinars, which is about 9,000 US dollars, in damages to a civilian who had suffered a gunshot wound. Um, and I'm disappointed to, to, to report that I'm not actually going to be able to play this video. Um, it doesn't work on, on the computer here. Um, but if I were to be able to play it, it would show um, an IS court official basically dispensing thousands of dollars of um, cash into a garbage bag and handing it to the plaintiff. Um, so obviously this is an IS propaganda video and therefore shouldn't be taken as fact. Um, but Syrians I've interviewed have told very similar stories about IS courts providing compensation to civilians who've been wrongfully harmed by IS fighters um, or by third parties, uh, including coalition airstrikes. So um, while the media tends to focus on the violent punishments um, administered by IS courts, um, I would argue that an underappreciated aspect of the legal system is its role in responding to the grievances of civilians who are really turning to IS as a provider of justice and security um, in the absence of other alternatives. So, having described uh, the basics of the IS legal system, I'm now going to argue that IS is using this legal system um, to promote state-building objectives um, in four uh, ways. Um, sorry. First, okay. First, IS uses its legal institutions uh, to legitimize its claims to sovereignty and territorial control. Um, when IS takes over a new territory, one of its um, first uh, moves is to open a court to um, adjudicate disputes between civilians and um, enforce law and order. This is a particularly effective public relations um, strategy in conflict areas where crime rates tend to be very high uh, and property rights are also um, frequently contested. Um, many Syrians have told me that they appreciated IS's ability to rapidly resolve um, land disputes that would have taken years to litigate in Syrian courts. Um, one Syrian from Aleppo um, even reported that his cousin decided to join IS um, after he was impressed um, uh, by the speed um, and efficiency with which um, the local IS court uh, resolved a land dispute for his aunt. Um, Additionally, because the IS justice system is so harsh, it's, um, it has uh, led to a precipitous drop in crime rates um, in IS-controlled areas. One Syrian told me that in his hometown of Aleppo, um, you could actually leave an iPhone on a table in a coffee shop um, for a week uh, and come back and it would still be there um, because everyone is afraid of being caught and punished for theft. Um, and uh, another opinion frequently is expressed to me in interviews um, is that although IS's rules are extremely harsh, um, they are applied fairly and predictably, um, such that, in the words of one Syrian, if you follow um, uh, if you follow the rules um, of the system, you are 100% guaranteed to stay safe. So, um, I found that in the early stages of IS's expansion into new areas, uh, it, it uses this court system um, as a way of earning the trust and respect of civilians. So. Um, second, um, an important uh, function of the IS legal system is its role in establishing what I interpret to be a kind of social contract. Um, in Islamic political philosophy, the whole concept of the caliphate is really based on um, a contract involving reciprocal rights and obligations between the caliph and the people. So although the rights of uh, Muslims subject to the IS caliphate are obviously extremely limited, um, and minority uh, groups like Christians have even fewer uh, protections, um, IS does claim to guarantee including the right to private property um, and the right to file complaints against IS officials who break the rules. Um, and more importantly, the, ca the caliphate offers um, a new form of collective identity um, to a lot of people who are joining it. So I would argue that IS is using its legal system um, as a foundation for a kind of new political community uh, that represents an alternative to existing states. Um, and to illustrate this point, um, here is a photo of IS members burning um, the passports of their home countries. And um, when we see IS members literally burning bridges to the nation states of which they were previously citizens, I take this as, um, uh, as evidence that they see themselves as entering into a kind of new social contract uh, with the caliphate. And um, I want to emphasize here also um, that the possibility of a new social contract um, that offers some form of, of law and order is particularly um, compelling uh, to people in a civil war environment where um, 
Um, most uh, have been living in conditions of complete chaos and uncertainty um, for the last five years or more. So in this context, when IS starts providing services and protection to the population, um, in exchange for uh, following its rules, it's not very difficult for this new system to be perceived as preferable to the available alternatives, which in Syria um, is right now is a choice between an authoritarian dictatorship or a state of total lawlessness. So um, I think that legitimacy uh, is a highly relative concept in wartime environments. And many of the people um, I talk to uh, who support IS do so not because they necessarily believe in its ideology, but simply because it is the lesser evil among a lot of really bad options. So um, third, uh, the IS legal system also plays a role in state building by promoting internal control and discipline within IS's own ranks, um, which I already touched on in my discussion of the rules that IS has established um, uh, to regulate the behavior of its own members. My interviewees have told me um, about numerous cases in which IS fighters or officials um, have been punished for misconduct, including drug trafficking, bribery, and unlawful violence against civilians, particularly in the Syrian context where outrage over the corruption and impunity of the Assad regime was one of the major catalysts of the 2011 uprising. IS's claim uh, that its own members and officials are not above the law um, has resonated to some extent with the population. Um, and last, uh, a fourth function of the IS legal system um, is to justify its collection of heavy taxes from civilians. As IS's territory has expanded, um, so has its tax base, and taxation has become an increasingly important source of revenue for the group over time. According to some estimates, um, IS, IS um, now derives um, six times as much revenue from taxation as it does from oil. Um, a problem for any government, uh, IS included, is that in the absence of a legal justification, taxation is indistinguishable from extortion or theft. No one likes to pay taxes, um, but people really don't like to pay taxes um, when, uh, when they think that the government is illegally stealing from them. So in an in attempt to, to legitimize its tax policies, IS has used its legal institutions to justify the extraction of revenue um, from civilians. And um, so for example, IS courts have issued orders um, uh, explaining the legal justification required to pay taxes on their harvest, also requiring fire, fighters to pay taxes on war spoils. Um, courts also issue receipts to confirm tax payments. And additionally, IS has published elaborate videos and other propaganda um, explaining the legal um, basis for its tax policies. So here's a screen uh, shot from one video about the institution of zakat, um, a mandatory charitable contribution that is the functional equivalent of a tax, um, which gives detailed instructions about the payment due on different types of assets. So for example, we see in this photograph that a person who owns between 14 and 15 camels um, is, is required to pay in taxes an um, amount equivalent to the value of two sheep. So um, this is really just one example of a larger effort by IS to represent itself as a rational, bureaucratic organization that clearly explains and justifies its policies to the public. So um, in conclusion, IS's legal system, I would argue, has been one of its greater strengths. Um, but I'm not going to argue that it is increasingly becoming a liability. As IS has expanded rapidly into new territory, it is becoming more and more difficult um, for the leadership to monitor and control the behavior of lower ranking officials and fighters, um, who are therefore increasingly taking advantage of the opportunity to violate some of the group's most basic principles and rules. So for example, IS claims to have a zero tolerance policy toward corruption and bribery, and also claims to be a meritocratic organization uh, that promotes members based on their actual achievements, regardless of personal connections, race, or national identity. Um, but as internal discipline within the group weakens, um, we are starting to see more and more reports of IS judges taking bribes, um, in addition to complaints about cronyism and preferential treatment of foreign fighters over Syrians. Um, I believe that this erosion of credibility is part of why we have seen an increase um, in, in the rate of desertions and defections in recent months. Um, IS deserters I have interviewed in Turkey um, said that they initially believed that um, IS wanted to bring security and, and Islamic justice to Syria, but over time they became disillusioned, um, saying things like, I felt like IS had lied to me. Uh, they turned out to be extremely authoritarian and arbitrary, just like the Syrian regime. Um, and also, IS has many double standards. It's unfair that foreign fighters get paid three times as much as Syrian fighters. So um, when IS fails to follow its own rules, um, it becomes increasingly vulnerable to accus accusations of hypocrisy. So the ISIS legal system, I would argue, um, can promote state building when it is functioning well. Uh, but as the legal system becomes increasingly corrupt and arbitrary, civilians and even IS's own members are increasingly questioning the legitimacy of a caliphate that claims to be based on principles of justice. Um, thanks.
into Islamic State ter territory temporarily for business purposes. Um, uh, so talk going uh, just about the D1s, so which I said are the, probably the main aspect of uh, Islamic State governance now. What's very interesting is that uh, the framework for them was drawn up in the 2013 to 2014 period. And a key figure, this is an unseen document, it's not been uh, uh, put in the public realm. A key figure actually in the, in the development of this framework of the Diwan, supposedly according to this internal Islamic State document which was distributed to fighters telling the stories of prominent figures, was a guy called Abu Yahya al -Ambari. And he was, uh, he was an Afghan, supposedly he had gone to fight in the Afghan Jihad in the 1980s, but he'd also fought in the Iran-Iraq war for the Iraqi army under, under Saddam Hussein's regime. Uh, and he justified it at the time, supposedly according to IS, by saying that, he'd been, uh, that it was uh, necessary to gain war expertise and how armies are organized and so on. Uh, but eventually he went back to Afghanistan, uh, got involved in the, the, you know, in the jihad there again, the establishment of the Taliban, and then he went back to Iraq and he got involved in the, uh, the groups that would then evolve into the Islamic State in Iraq. And specifically, he put forward, he put, Al Ambari put forward the series of organizations, the Yuans and centers. And then he sent them to the Medjidish Shura, this is the consultation council that advises uh, uh, the leader of the Islamic State, in this case, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. Uh, and uh, they, they built upon that, upon other consultations of the brothers, uh, to form the organizational frameworks for the D1s. Um, so, uh, now going on to the specific structures, according to IS, there's this, well, there's this video that was released in July of 2016 uh, that gives a, an overview of the administrative framework, or at least as they presented. Um, so as I mentioned, the, 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 the Diwans, which are these government departments, for example, the Diwan Hispa, uh, as mentioned in the previous presentation by Mara, uh, revol uh, referring to the enforcement of Islamic morality, the Diwan of Zakat, also again mentioned in the previous presentation, dealing with Zakat taxation, and uh, which, as Mara mentioned, is quite a complex system. Um, and then uh, territorially, they speak of their wilayas and their, 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 how they they divided their territories into all these different provinces. And then they, they also give space for some committees and offices. And one of them mentioned is the Hydra Committee, for example, which I mentioned in a previous slide. And then, of course, they have the very higher bodies, like the Delegated Committee, the Caliph himself, and the, uh, the Shura Council. Uh, the Delegated Committee, you'll see what this amounts to in a, in a, in a subsequent slide. Um, so as I mentioned, the Duan sets to function as government departments. They cover a range of aspects of life, like uh, education, the military, and public services. Um, the impression the video gives is of a very top-down control, where you have central ministries issuing directives to their regional offices in the provinces or the wilayas and also the more local level. Uh, there's also an impression given in the uh, there is also an impression given in the uh, in the uh, 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 in the video uh, that it's all uniform. Like there's, there's the same structure as existing somehow in every in all of these wilayas of the Islamic State. So the question you have to ask yourself is how far is that actually borne out in the ground evidence? And my own particular focus looks at uh, Islamic State documents, both ones that I obtain privately and also those that uh, make it into the open source realm. Uh, and I think in relation to this, I think we also need to consider in particular how IS responds to challenges, you know, uh, with local as opposed to more general decision making. So what you find actually is a bit of a mixed picture. Um, if you take the Diwan Hispa, for example, which I mentioned deals with the enforcement of Islamic morality. Uh, you very clearly have a central Diwan Hispa in the Islamic State government, government that could issue general directives to uh, the regional, the, the provincial departments of it. Um, so, for example, this document, which was found in Memnid uh, by Kurdish forces, uh, was, was issued by the head of the, the, the general, the head of the general Diwan Hispa, the Abu Sadr. His name was Abu Sadr uh, Al Arabi. And uh, this document from around uh, the, oct uh, the autumn of 2014, he suggested a, an exchange program um, um, of officials 
between Nehua province in Iraq, this is around the Mosul area, and three of the Syrian provinces, uh, uh, Aleppo, Homs, and Raqqa, uh, this is of Syrian wilayas of the Islamic State, has suggested an exchange program of, uh, of swapping officials between these provinces so they could gain, you know, they, 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 for, uh, like, like work experience, if you like. Um, so this is an example of a, of a of central of 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 a top down function. Um, another good example actually comes of education. Uh, there are general directives issued by the, the higher D1 at Talim of the Islamic State, which was led by well, has been led by a German guy called Reda Seyam, also known as Du Al Qarnay, by his uh, the, the Arabic pen name he goes by in the document. Um, and a uh, uh, key issue, of course, has been the, of the, for the Islamic State, of, you know, education is a very key thing in terms of promoting its values and ideology to the next generation. The uh, question is, how do you integrate uh, the existing uh, uh, administrative framework uh, of teachers who taught under uh, the uh, Iraqi system and the Syrian system, which is built markedly different ideologically from uh, the Islamic State. Um, because the Islamic State, of course, doesn't just have, doesn't simply have uh, uh, its own uh, cadres of teachers ready to be able to educate the population. They have to work with, you know, you partly have to work with what you've got. So, um, a key issue then was the Islamic, the Islamic State's Diwan at Talim uh, had to investigate how to deal with these problem, to, to deal with this problem, you know, of having teachers and educational staff uh, who aren't, uh, uh, used to this system, and they coordinated with uh, the head uh, of the for the Ifta, which means the investigation and fatwa issuing department or committee of uh, the Islamic State. The terminology isn't always consistent. Uh, again, this conflicts with the video somewhat of the structure of the caliphate because sometimes you see the head and behoof for Ifta referred to as the Diwan and behoof for Ifta. Um, so the terminology isn't always consistent either. But basically, anyway, in the end, around December of 2014, this uh, this message, this 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 little book was issued by the Hitler Behoof uh, uh, a clarification message in uh, affirming the ruling on the educational system in the Musavi government, which refers to the Syrian regime. Uh, in particular, they would the the, the 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 document looks into the Syrian education system and. Uh, uh, the, 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 the idea is to come up with a ruling on how to deal with the educational staff who are now living in territories controlled by IS territory. The conclusion was in having chosen to work under the Syrian uh, regime's education system that these educational staff had fallen into apostasy. Um, and so as a result there, there had to be repentance programs organized uh, uh, by the relevant uh, local governing bodies of IS uh, in, the, in, in, in these territories. And uh, you know, to, to, to give them Dorat Sharia as well, to uh, teach them uh, about you know, the Islamic State's ideologies and, and value system. Um, again, another, so that's another example of, of uh, top down governance. And you saw throughout uh, the first half of 2015 in particular uh, these repentance programs being organized for teachers and educational staff in various uh, IS territories in various uh, territories of IS, in particular in Syria. Uh, another example of uh, top-down we see with the G General Supervisory Committee of the Islamic State, uh, referred to in the video as the Delegated Committee. Um, it has the power to issue notifications to the, all, the, all the Walayas and Diwans, uh, uh, informing them of a general matter or making a general request. In this case, um, the, the General Supervision Committee, this is a document uh, I got from a private contact in uh, Haska. Um, it's uh, calling for surveys of, the, uh, of, uh, of, of agricultural staff and, and uh, capabilities in the various provinces. Uh, it's calling for this general survey to be referred back to the Diwan of Zirah, or the agricultural Diwan, which will be at the higher level, and also to the centers uh, of the Diwan of Zirah in, in, in the various provinces. Um, so what about the other side then? These are examples of top-down governments. What, uh, is there some, is, uh, what about some more of uh, the issue of more local, uh, more local control? Um, I mentioned this issue about uh, the Islamic State video giving that the impression of, of uniformity 
you know, that these D1s all exist as very well organized system in all the will items, but this is not actually the case as other internal documents show. This document from Fallujah, for example, uh, from May of uh, 2015, uh, so this is around uh, nine months after the Fallujah Wilaya uh, or province was set up following the IS's complete defeat of all the insurgents in the Fallujah area by August of 2014. Um, this document uh, shows that a number of Diwans uh, in the Fallujah Wilaya were actually established many months after the Fallujah Wilaya had been set up. So this includes a Diwan in Zirah for the Fallujah area. A Diwan al Iqar dealing with real estate. There is no mention of the uh, Diwan al Iqar in that Islamic State video. Uh, the impression given actually is that the, the Diwan al Iqar, or, or masses of real estate, sorry, are dealt with by the uh, Islamic State Judiciary Department or the Diwan al Qadha. Uh, there's also mention of the Diwan al, al, al Zakat and also a Diwan al Rakaz in uh, the Fallujah area. And uh, crucially, the document says that. Um, it's been decided to form these Diwan in the form of a Diwan or independent office, or completely independent, and its connection is only to be with the Wali or the provincial governor of Fallujah, of the Fallujah Wilaya, or the general administrative official uh, of, uh, of, of the Fallujah Wilaya, or the deputy, of, and the deputy uh, provincial governor of Fallujah. Um, so the fact that these Diwans weren't formed until nine months, uh, uh, some, some Diwans of the uh, uh, Islamic State were not formed until after uh, the, uh, several months after the Fallujah Wilayah was formed, shows that governance, uh, just to illustrate my point about you know, that it's not quite as uniform as the Islamic State makes it out to be. Had uh, is, is the issue of medical brain drain, uh, that is medical professionals leaving Islamic State territory because they don't want to live there, uh, or for, for whatever reason. Um, and this problem seems particularly pronounced in, um, in, in, in the Mosul area, or in the Wilayat Nainwan. Um, and uh, this document which I got from a pharmacist uh, who fled Mosul to uh, northern Syria, and uh, then from there went on to Turkey. Um, there's a mention of a particular problem of, uh, uh, this is from early 2016, uh, of, of pharmacists and doctors who basically sold all they had in their clinics and, and pharmacies in order to get enough money to, to flee uh, Islamic State territory. Um, so as a result, there's a directive issue, issued here to uh, people in the health department of Willi Nainwa because all doctors and medical staff in a given Islamic State province is said to be part of the health administration of that Islamic State Wilaya. Uh, and it said it's forbidden to uh, sell uh, medical equipment and uh, medicines to, the, to people outside the Wilaya um, for the purpose of clearing out. Um, and so the frag, as, as, as the Arabic term goes, um, this basis, they say, refers to um, people selling all their stuff to generate enough money to flee. Uh, and then it orders for copies of this to be sent to local, relevant local offices in, in, in Nainwood province, like the Islamic police and the Diwan al Um uh, Then also, you know, another problem has been that uh, uh, facing the Islamic State has been intelligence penetration by the coalition. Um, and, uh, you know, a number of high profile figures have been taken out. Um, and uh, as a result, for example, in, in various areas over time, it's not done consistently at all at one time, but in various places you see the local administration puts in internet restrictions. Uh, these latest ones that came from Mosul, for example, only last month, actually basically present to the idea of having a private internet connection. And the only ones that are allowed are, are really are private uh, internet, uh, are, are internet halls licensed by the Islamic State. Basically the idea is to stop, is to um, uh, stop private, uh, to limit private internet access as far as possible uh, because it is pretty clear that uh, one of the ways that you know, the coalition gets valuable intel is, is through people leaking information to them uh, for whatever reason. 
Um, so uh, that's an example. That's a note that the, all I've talked about so far from internal from those internal documents. You notice probably it's, it's, it's all come from Iraq and Syria. Um, and I'd say these provinces and wilayas they represent the most sophisticated manifestation of the caliphate administration, or as you use the Arabic term of timkin or realization. Um, but uh, the Islamic State also claimed 16 provinces beyond Iraq and Syria. Uh, three in Libya, six in Yemen, two in Bilal al-Haramein, this refers to Saudi Arabia, uh, one in uh, Khorasan, which is Afghanistan, Pakistan, one in West Africa, uh, one in Algeria, one in Sinai, and one in the Caucasus. Uh, it will be noted actually that the 16 provinces uh, referred to here, uh, the Islamic State has occasionally in its propaganda referred to other wilayas or provinces existing. So they claimed a wilayas in Bahrain in, uh, in, uh, in eastern Saudi Arabia, but actually this turns out to be, uh, it, 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 it doesn't exist at all. Uh, they don't claim it in the video, and in other internal stuff I've seen, they don't, they don't claim a wilayas in Bahrain. It just seemed to be a, a propaganda of the moment. Um, generally speaking, these provinces, um, whose relations are managed with the centre by a distant provinces administration, they lack a development of governance on the ground. The main exception to this has been Libya. Um, I think Libya always, always offered the ideal environment for the Islamic State in terms of being chaotic uh, and having valuable, potential valuable resources and well-established connections with the centre uh, because of Libyan jihadis who've been going to Iraq and Syria. Um, this was the only real main exception in terms of realizing governments that could really replicate what you were seeing in Iraq and Syria. Um, so you see this, uh, you see plenty of evidence in, uh, from particularly from the Syrian strip area along the Mediterranean coastline uh, that was controlled by the Islamic State. So for example, this document from Nofalia uh, is an Islamic police document and it refers to, uh, 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 it, uh, it refers to guarantees left by a prisoner. Uh, when uh, we're being brought in or taken out. Um, this is a, uh, from Sirte itself, it's from the health center, the co-optation of the medical administration there, uh, refers to a blood report for a release by them. You'll notice it's all done in English, of course, because this is pretty normative that I would say Arabic is not the best language for uh, doing a deep medical analysis, so in, in, English is much more normative. Um, this uh, is a call from within Sirte City for a reconciliation session between factions in Sirte issued by the Islamic State in May of 2016. Uh, and then this is an exam, to exam for, 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 for the conclusion of a Shara'i session, you know, which, is, which is brought in to teach administrative staff in various areas about and, and, and people who've repented about, uh, 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 about Islamic State uh, uh, ideology and, uh, and, and beliefs and so on. Uh, so, for example, this, this, this exam, one of the questions is, you know, define Targhut, what is Tawheed, referring to Islamic monotheism, and, and so on and so forth. Oh. Ah, okay. Um, this from, uh, this uh, from Khorasan, from the eastern Afghanistan, uh, from eastern Afghanistan in, in particular, uh, it's uh, timing. Uh, it's uh, prayer timings for I think for Ramadan. Um, beyond this, though, there's not really much at all you get from the Afghanistan area in terms of administration and uh, and documents to show uh, development of real governance. Uh, Yemen uh, is particularly interesting because it was a case where a number of uh, Islamic State officials in Yemen actually revolted against the, uh, or uh, rejected the wali or provincial governor that uh, uh, IS Central had appointed over all of the Yemeni provinces. And as a result, a number of these people were then expelled by the Islamic State. Um, uh, so the Yemeni affiliates of IS have suffered considerably and have, I think really lost out to AQ. Uh, you do see some kind of basic, uh, some very rudimentary structures that exist. For example, this, this Shara'i court, but there's no specific wilaya given. It seems like there's only one Shara'i court for the whole of the Yemeni provinces. And this, this one deals with a case of someone who was accused of supporting uh, the Houthis in Yemen. And uh, uh, in, in conclusion, the Islamic State requires him uh, to, to issue a repentance because of certain expressions he said 
which he insisted were jokes, but actually they say, no, these, these expressions you uttered uh, constitute uh, kufr and apostasy, and uh, you must repent of them. Um, as a result of this lack of success for the Islamic State on the distant level, there has been some internal skepticism about distant provinces. This has not been publicized yet, but um, uh, I managed to obtain some texts written by a guy called Abu Farooq al Masri, who seems quite, seemed quite well connected to the Islamic State leadership. Uh, and uh, he was based out of Raqqa, he disappeared around six months ago, um, uh, following an, a, a, an internal tract he issued to his followers in Raqqa. Uh, he suggested that allegiance pledges, pledges of the distant provinces, uh, of these uh, distant affiliates that pledged allegiance and were made into provinces of these distant provinces of the Islamic State, they should have just been taken secretly rather than declaring provinces. Uh, he says that in doing that, they were bringing uh, in, in, in declaring all these provinces, these these uh, feelings from abroad were being brought above, you know, were being brought to a level beyond what they actually were. Um, and he specifies, you know, that not all places have the circumstances of Iraq, Syria, and Libya, uh, you know, to realize governance on the ground. Um, so there is a, a question of, you know, is, is IS actually is, is IS actually heeding these criticisms? Because we see in a lot of places where the Islamic State has claimed a mark of, in the international level in Somalia, in Tunisia, in Indonesia, and the Philippines, and Bangladesh, uh, they haven't declared wilayas in these places. They just claim operations. Um, so it's, a, it's an interesting question, actually, whether the wilaya model actually on the international level uh, has, has effectively been suspended. Um, these are Abu al Farooq al Masri's works. The, so this is banned in Raqqa. This is the political and organizational program for the Islamic State, as suggested by Abu al Farooq al Masri. And then his Rasai in Menhaj, uh, his subsequent work that got him uh, disappeared. Uh, and then the particular page here where he talks about this issue of the provinces and that they should have, he suggests they should have taken their allegiance pledges secretly. Um, so, I mean, that, that concludes my presentation, and this is my email contact and my website, and thank you very much. Our last speaker for this session is Jose Martinez. Uh, Jose Martinez is a Gates Cambridge Scholar and a PhD candidate at the Department of Politics and International Studies at the University of Cambridge. His research focuses on neoliberal economic reforms, food politics, welfare systems, and the spatial dynamics of political contestation in the Levant. Um, his presentation is titled, It's All About Bread, State Building in the Arena of Contested Sovereignties. Good morning, everyone. I'm uh, Jose Martinez. I'm, uh, uh, as Monte said, I'm a PhD student in political science. Before I begin, I just wanted to thank uh, Nine Jenna and Amec for inviting me. I grew up in uh, a small island in the Caribbean called Puerto Rico, and uh, South Africa. Its struggle for uh, self determination, its example of nonviolent resistance, always stood out as an example for us. So to be here is uh, is quite a distinct honor and pleasure. So. Today I'm going to talk about uh, theories of sovereignty, and then I'm going to try to bring it back and uh, talk about the Syrian civil war. I'm going to dwell quite a bit on theory here, because I think the concepts we use and the terms we employ to study places like Syria are important. So uh, forgive me for this, but I'm going to take many of you back, I guess, to the political science uh, 101. So sovereignty. Uh, it's a term we throw around, we like to use it, and generally when political scientists talk about sovereignty, they refer back to Max Weber's uh, kind of original definition, which is uh, the institutional bureaucracy that claims the, monopol the monopoly of a legitimate use of physical force within a given territory. So this is the classic definition, it's the one we constantly use, it's the basis of much of international law. And I think there's a problem with this definition, and I think it hinders our analysis. And my, my first and uh, primary critique of it is that it equates the state, sovereignty, and territory. Basically, it imagines all states uniformly exerting their control over what are kind of these static uh, spaces of territory. So imagine when we talk about states, when we talk about international law, this is the, the conceptual apparatus that is implicitly operating almost always. 
But as most people here know, no such monopoly in Syria exists. I mean, this is an old map of the regions controlled and the areas controlled by different fighting forces. But where exactly is the institutional bureaucracy with the monopoly on legitimate use of force? I mean, clearly, there's more than, than one group competing for sovereignty. And here's another map, also a bit dated, but it shows the variety of people struggling over control. And how about the legitimate use of force? I mean, I think it'd be hard to claim that any one group in Syria has a monopoly on, uh, on the legitimate use of force. So I think clearly what we need to do is to decouple sovereignty, the state, and territory. And I'm going to try to show why that is an important kind of theoretical move. So over the last 10 years, especially over, over the last uh, five, kind of a growing literature has emerged called the rebel governance literature. And what it tries to do is to say, okay, in war zones, clearly, there is not just, uh, we don't just live in a Hobbesian world, right, where, la where life is nasty, brutish, and short, where there's anarchy and chaos. There are other groups competing and offering public services, and uh, the term that, they've, that this literature and these scholars have come up with are rebel governments. And I put up here some of the main sources if anyone would like to go in and read some of this. And they push against, I guess, the classic uh, assumptions of the literature that are, you know, that there's one uh, institutional bureaucracy that has the monopoly on legitimate force. And they study places uh, like Colombia, all sorts of different countries in Africa where there are various people trying to claim <coughs> Uh, sovereignty and uh, legitimacy. And what they claim is that we have competing sovereigns. And this is, this is uh, quite a useful lens. It can help us study why different rebel groups and insurgencies provide public services, right? I think it can also help us look at things like judicial institutions, right? Why is it that rebel groups in uh, throughout the African continent in the Middle East have established uh, these sorts of uh, public services? But I still believe this approach, which is kind of the most innovative and cutting edge, has some very serious limitations. And I think, for one, it can only accommodate and do justice to establish rebels and government forces. So this is kind of what I see as the classic paradigm of rebel governance, right? You have good guys, you have bad guys. They both don't look particularly nice. And they both are trying to secure a monopoly on legitimate use of force. But I think this approach has no analytical room for actors that play a key role in Syria. And this is a very crude cartoon, but clearly it points to the fact that all sorts of international actors are uh, rolling the dice, as we, uh, as one would say, right? And uh, there are obviously other actors involved in the Syrian theater and in Iraq as well, but the rebel governance assumes these two sovereigns, right? We have one against the other, but it has no analytical space. How can we analyze what it is that these regional actors are doing? I also don't think it has space for humanitarian. Fifteen to 35% of Syrians now depend for their livelihood on the provision of, of, of uh, foreign aid, international aid, generally provided by the UN World Food Program and its local, its local um, kind of, or, the organizations it outsources it works, it's, uh, it works to. So I think, uh, yeah, the predominant approach cannot help explain what it is these actors are doing. So basically what we have is this in the classical vision, right? You have two, you have the rebels, you have the government, and the civilians are stuck in the middle, and there's no one else participating, right? But I think uh, what it misses out on is, uh, as Charles Tilley, this kind of eminent scholar that Ibrahim mentioned yesterday, is that most people, most of the time, are interacting in nonviolent ways. And I think Ayman and Mara's uh, presentations help show there's a lot going on in these places. It's not just violence, war, and fighting. So I think uh, when I was trying to make sense of what was going on in Syria, I found a few uh, kind of post-structural approaches very useful. And I'm going to try to outline this now, but it is quite crude because of, because of time, but I'm happy to talk, about, to talk more about this in the, in the Q&A. So I draw mainly on Foucault and Agamben. And Agamben is this very interesting Italian political theorist who traces his conception of sovereignty back to Roman law. And his uh, contention is that sovereignty is not an institutional bureaucracy with the controls over the monopoly on legitimate force, but it's the monopoly to decide kind of who dies, generally through the law, but not necessarily. And what I find Agamben useful for is kind of decoupling sovereignty from the state, right? So it's no longer state actors who are sovereign, or as the rebel governance literature would argue, it's not just rebels either, but it's, a, it's more complex. And then uh, what Agamben, what people who have studied Agamben and have used him have argued is that what we see 
when we apply his theoretical lens to places like Syria and Iraq is mobile sovereignties, graduated sovereignties, right? Where the monopoly to decide shifts, right? And I think this is very useful for studying uh, the Islamic State because its territorial control is fluid, its boundaries are also fluid. Some places have been under its control for longer, but others are, uh, are shifting, are not necessarily stable. So I think uh, it shows us that sovereignty is constantly in production. Right? We do not need to think of it as a static uh, sort, of, sort of order. And I think the empirical added value, which I'll go on to now, is that we can more fully grasp its iterations uh, during the Syrian conflict. And I see state building, the provision of everyday, what we conceive of as state services, as an attempt to strive uh, for sovereignty. So I'm going to talk now a little bit about uh, the Islamic State. And these are somewhat, I mean, this is also from about a year ago, and uh, most of my, most of the information I draw on comes from interviews, from uh, information released by the Information Office of the Wulaid of Raha, where most people call it, describe it as the eponymous capital of the Islamic State. So it's been kind of control of around 2 million residents, this obviously fluctuates in 21,000 square kilometers, and it's the place where ISIS has been controlled for the longest and the most consistent, and has been able to develop its kind of administrative apparatus in uh, the most extensive ways. So what do we see ISIS do in the places it controls? And I mean, I'm an admirer, I've gone into this at length, but I think I want to dwell on what has been uh, published for internal consumption. So in their internal pamphlets, they talk about agriculture. There's a very elaborate plan for growing wheat. There's a public service department, the Diwan al which uh, does things like pick up trash, uh, fill up potholes on the street, all the things you would expect of kind of your local municipal government. There's education, which Ayman also touched upon. There's public security. There's a court system. There's flower provision. And then uh, my own interest is in their, uh, in their bread, in the provision of bread and what it means and what it demonstrates about the Islamic State. So I want to dwell on bread a bit here because uh, subsidized bread is one of the, the, the most longest standing welfare programs in Syria. So beginning in 1970 when uh, Bashar al-Assad's uh, father took over the country, for the last 40 years, 45 uh, years, Syrians have been receiving subsidized bread. It costs around 12 cents a kilo, and it's been the same price for 20 years. And uh, Hafez al-Assad uh, took uh, counsel from uh, the Soviet early 70s, who told him, we need to control wheat and bread. This is our experience. And he elaborated a kind of a development plan in which, from the beginning of the supply chain until the end, wheat was completely controlled by the Syrian government. So farmers grew wheat with seeds given to them by the government, with fertilizer subsidized in turn by the government. They were only allowed to sell their wheat to the, the government's agricultural ministry, who then sent it to flour mills, controlled by the government, who then distributed it to bakeries who had to give it at a certain price. So over 45 years, and uh, I mean, the ubiquity of bakeries in Syria, for anyone who was able to visit before the war, was uh, incredible, right? There was one in every corner, people depended, it, depended on it for their... Once they take over a new section of the country, one of the first things they do is to take control of the bakery and the flour mill and to provide bread. I mean, it's a classic example of a state service, an example of exerting their sovereignty that Syrian citizens find to be very important. And there have been protests in all areas of Syria where bread has been of uh, bad quality, or as bread has, been of, uh, has, has not been available to all of its residents, right? And this shows also, I think, the agency that civilians have in war zone and how their demands can alter patterns of governance in certain places. <clears throat> so what I have found, and, uh, and many others, is that especially in its, in its early iterations, kind of 2014, the first half of 2015, ISIS kind of constantly found the need to perform the state, right, to strive for sovereignty. And it did this through kind of the micro practices of authority, which Ayman's documents, I mean, do an incredible task of kind of demonstrating. They, they want to strive to look like a state, to act like a state, and this involves uh, symbolic acts of statehood, like setting up an education system, like, a, how do you say it, like collecting taxes, 
as uh, Mara said, and then everyday techniques of governance, like uh, providing bread. And what I think these do is more than just to kind of co-opt local residents, keep them quiet, but I think it also is crucial to giving a governing authority like the Islamic State its institutional appearance and its power. And ironically, over the last um, six or seven months, because of a host of factors, but it has a lot to do with kind of the bombing efforts led by uh, Russia and the coalition, one of the first things that ISIS has had to retract for lack of funds is its uh, bread provision services. And you've seen increasing levels of, of protests in certain areas. So I think a crucial thing when we ponder the, area, the areas that ISIS has controlled, especially going forward, is to dissect these kind of everyday services, right? What are they doing? Are they, uh, are they successful? How is it that they go about performing like a state, trying to demonstrate their authority? And not just for ISIS, right, but for every other group performing in Syria. I think one of uh, the key tasks of any kind of governing authority, whether it be at the local level, the regional, or the national, if, if we want to ponder what the Syria, the options for the Iraqi government is going forward, is to act like a state, right? Firm services that are expected by, by its population. So I think the added value of this approach is to ponder, right, who is the sovereign? When we look at an area in Syria or Iraq, I think Minbij is a very interesting place to ponder because of uh, kind of the coalition forces with the, the, I guess, the Syrian Democratic forces, as they're called, is probably going to take over the area before. They take over the area in the next month. And it's an interesting case because in Munbij, before the Islamic State took over, one of the first things it did was to take over a flour mill just outside the, the town. And one of the biggest demands of the local coordination council, which are these like local bodies that, can, that uh, offer administrative services in rebel-held areas, was to uh, demand from foreign donors flour and bread. Right? This is something we need to be able to feed the local population, maintain their allegiance, and the Islamic State very cleverly took over it, right? So now that they are very probably going to get uh, kicked out, I think it'll be interesting to see if the Syrian Democratic Forces, if the administrative, the civilian kind of administrative structure does things like, like provide bread. So I think uh, wondering whose violence legi is legitimate and who is sovereign in these sort of situations, it's a difficult question, right? I mean, this is a, a parody here, but as we all know, I mean, the Russians have been very, uh, very involved, let's say, in the Syrian theater. And is their violence legitimate? Is it not? So under the classical definition, it's difficult to answer who, who would be the sovereign in Syria because you have all sorts of actors participating. Who has a monopoly to decide? This is a local Diwan deciding, I think it is, on a, on, yeah, it's a tribal council who's trying to decide, uh, I believe this is the case of uh, of a tr one tribe which was loyal to the Assad regime and what to do with them. And uh, so they clearly have some uh, decision-making power. And then the other question is, uh, yeah, who has a monopoly to decide who lives or dies? When so many Syrians are dependent on foreign aid, clearly the World Food Program wields incredible sovereign power, right? When you feed 15 to 35% of the population, we wield a certain sort of uh, authority. So I think these actors need to be integrated into our way of thinking about sovereignty and state-making. I do want to dwell on this last picture a bit just to kind of demonstrate the importance of what I was saying. This is a World Food Program package, and you can see it just sticking out on the left, the, the slow packages that were being, that were supposed to be sent, I think it's to Idlib. They, they took them and then they recovered them with their own propaganda, you know, announcing that they were the ones distributing bread and it wasn't the UN. So the fact that they took, and I believe there are 7,000 packages in this delivery, the fact that they took their own propaganda on top of the UN, I think demonstrates the importance of being a senior state actor in this So, what I found and what I think is important to think about is that sovereignty in these places is not uniform, it's not easy to define, but it's shared and contested by an array of organizations and the post-structural kind of approaches that I've mentioned can integrate all these actors in ways that I think kind of a classical definition simply cannot. And I think what we see in Syria is a, a field of contingent and mobile sovereignties, right? And what is uh, necessary to for state building in the future when everyone has had 
various experiences of local governments for the last four or five years. And the longer it lasts, the more varying these experiences will come, right? So I think when sovereignty is tentative, when it's hard to define, emergent and constantly shifting, I think a useful lens is to look at the mundane, right? To return to that which we tend to underestimate, but when you don't have running water or electricity or food to feed your family, the mundane becomes uh, very important. So I think we should ponder these kind of symbolic acts of statehood, these everyday techniques of governance. And of course, this is an exaggeration because it's my own field of study and specialty, but in some ways it is uh, all about bread. Of Iraq. Um, just to um, to contribute to a discussion that has been focusing on whether uh, the Daesh group is, uh, is acting as a state or they have the sovereignty or not sovereignty. Um, so I would like to put forward the experience of uh, in Iraq of how uh, Daesh acted uh, in this aspect. What, um, what has not uh, been uh, shown is the, is the uncovered side of this matter. Uh, a lot of uh, information that has been uh, processed uh, is uh, based on propaganda of uh, Daesh which is usually propagated by the media because that was media would like some material to propagate. The real things is not uh, in circulation. I must uh, uh, admire the first uh, speaker who used interviews which is much more Thank you. 
Thank you very much. I think the question of the regime change doctrine by particular powers needs to be taken into account. What they support, how they support, and, and what happens. In Africa, we have the challenge when it happened in Egypt. of the panelists because yes Mr. Ambassador you have all this up a court that was dealing with the long-lasting land disputes and they solved about one side So we have to mediate between the family of killer Uh, between those 
legitimate local council, which kind of was great in organizing the local level, but not reaching their own kids, and Daesh and subverts the, the idea of the state of lacking the legitimacy. I was, I was wondering if you acknowledge the fact that this legal system is still evolving um, and how do you account uh, to that in your research and is it really a rapid development? Are they being able to um, address the issues that they, uh, you mentioned the people are finding uh, protesting against? Thank you. Good morning, thank you. Uh, my name is Anthony van Uyckert. I'm from the Witt School of Governance. Um, and I want to ask a question about sovereignty. I was inspired by the last speaker who was Bill Gates. Uh, when you ask a, a seemingly um, an innocent question, who is the sovereign? And I want to invite the panel to extend their thinking I know there are Somali representatives of the sovereign state <laughs> in the room. I mean, surely, Chair, they can participate if they so wish. Let me hasten to add, I don't know where to ask this question about state building in the course of this two-day conference. This is the closest that I can do it. But uh, if our esteemed director of AMEC wants to redirect the question to another panel, or maybe towards the conclusion, I'd be very happy. But I think a discussion around state building uh, might be relevant for the uh, the panel. Um, so uh, thanks uh, for your for uh, your question as to whether or not um, the IS uh, legal system is evolving. Um, I think it absolutely is. Um, I think it's difficult to know sort of in what ways. I think definitely since 2013 we've seen an evolution in the complexity of um, of the court system. Um, I think we have also seen an evolution in terms of sort of the dysfunctionalities as um, sort of parts of the organization begin to unravel a bit. And that's sort of part of what I'm trying to do with this data collection project is to eventually sort of be able to um, to see um, changes in the system over time. Um, uh, you know, looking to the experience of the, the Taliban. And evolve um, significantly over time, um, including sort of in their in their relationship to sort of international law, the inter international community, and you know the Taliban um, began to publish uh, publicly issuing um, you know series of internal codes of conduct. I believe in 2006, which went through a few iterations, um, and then in 2010, uh, you know, began a process of seeking status with the United Nations. So I think at present it doesn't look like IS is anywhere on a trajectory of that nature. Um, but these organizations do evolve, um, so I think it'll be very interesting to watch. Should be. I know what it looks like at the moment. I think it's um, muddled, not clear. But I'd like to merge with your question to stop about the Global Coordination Council and sort of merge the two narratives. And I think uh, Stop is exactly right. I mean, it's the absurdity of running a local council that is the head of the legal system. And I think one of the main reasons is a complete lack of function and a lack of consciousness by foreign bodies that these local, uh, local administrative structures, often democratically elected, often quite recognizable, often incredibly 
to play into this role. I think it would have been a very interesting role for a place like South Africa to play, right? To say, we are about local democracy and local empowerment. Let us support those local coordination councils that Christoph mentioned. But generally, when you talk to any activist on a local coordination council, the first thing they'll say is, we do not have enough funds, right? I think this is, is something to, to ponder. In terms of the question from the professor from Witz, I mean, I think Somalia is eminently complicated in ways very similar to, to Syria, but for very different reasons. Who is the sovereign? I think there are many sovereigns, right? I think this is the problem with the international law that says there is one sovereign, so how do we deal Building. I think you know, we should talk I think, more about this, and I'm, I'm curious to talk to you after to see what exactly you would like to elaborate, or like, like to have us elaborate. But what I find very interesting about the Syrian case is how much the, the practices of the Syrian state have been mimicked by rebel groups, and even by the Islamic State, right? Bread is a very classic example. The health insurance system, run by various rebel authorities, is incredibly similar to that by the Syrian government beforehand the education system as well. So, I mean, clearly none of this is being done on a blank slate, right? Their experiences, their expectations among civilians. And I think it's crucial to, to, to kind of decipher the long-term outcome of the war, right? Who does these things best? Who has the most funds to do them? Will probably have the most success. And I think it's something uh, foreign powers sending in money left and right to harm people just don't seem to understand. Presentation, uh, I could be wrong. Gave me a perception. Sorry? Who are you addressing? Mara. Uh, your presentation uh, gives the impression or creates the conception that there is a very sophisticated governance system. Now, we know that the governance can be effective in an area of stability. Now, I'm trying to understand from the picture that you've painted is that they have an effective governance system which is working and from the interviews you have conducted there's a degree of satisfaction from, from, the, from the service delivery of the judicial system. Now, I would like to know whether this is an effective system in pockets of stability because this is not an area that is uh, at peace. It's, it's an area of violence. There's bombings going on. There's constant uh, air, area bombardments taking place on these territories. So the picture doesn't you know, show, doesn't reflect that. So the question is, this effective system that you project, is it only within a tissue? Stability pockets. You get you get the question that I'm trying to get to. Is this over the entire territory under their control, or only in areas where there is some semblance of stability? And is this system going to be viable, given the fact that there is attacks on ISIS territory and things are fluid? That's there. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Oh, okay. My question is directed to Mara. 
Mara, I'm just, I'm fascinated by the social Washi. contrast. Sorry, Washi, you mind standing up? Oh, okay. Thank you. Oh, be short. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Mara, my, my question is, I'm fascinated by the social contract theory. Um, I'm thinking of this caliphate, whatever it is. modified to suit the modern society because uh, the current caliphate obviously it lives and exists in, in a modern village, um, global village and one one as a social group do they have any common identity to even share their rights to you know, some imaginable kind of uh, governing body, you know, because uh, I'm trying to get to understand whether this is an existing territory with an existing authority, or is it just being imagined and wished by whoever occupied and if you can, you bring us back to uh, Rousseau's uh, uh, social contract to say, uh, are we applying this original uh, form? Are we modernizing it? Thank you. Yeah, thanks. It's my turn. Yes. Uh, my question is uh, to Ayman especially, um, but can be divided into three parts. One is the, the, the issue of, of the structure and so on, on, on the recruitment. Now I know that uh, this is done mainly by Twitter and, and, and what other, other uh, social media. And yesterday, la la last, the last session yesterday, uh, Twitter and so on. And, and lastly, um, there's this kind of thing about you know, uh, it says nothing about Israel, and, and you know, and, and, and with the issue of Palestine, with, with regards to the IS group. Um, thank you. George? Okay, thank you, Um My question is directed to the first two speakers. Uh, maybe it's a bit of a comment. I, I just want to, to find out, I heard what this just said, but when we talk about law or governance, what law is it? International law, do they subscribe to international law? Or, or there is a, a Muslim law called Sharia that they, they um, claim to be, to be followed. So if we're talking governance here, is it according to that one? How does it compare to the, the Taliban, uh, uh, what the Taliban normally argue to want to implement, should they be running the government? My last question will be that I've listened to a number of uh, researchers, and most of them uh, agree that there has never been any, I don't know what to call ISIS, any pressure group, if I can classify them into that or, or jihadists, whoever managed to get to the point where they say we are now in government, ever. Al-Qaeda, Taliban, uh, whichever the group that uh, claims to be wanting to implement uh, a new Islamic uh, state or the state of government. Thank you, Professor Speakers. Um, I'll address the thing about recruitment structure. Um, well, you could, I mean, it's just variety of functions you could take on the Islamic State. You could be an Idali or an official, you could be a, you could be a Jindi or a soldier. 
and uh, there are a variety of different structures through which you go through. You can go through the Adat from West Garad, which is the campus administration uh, that will uh, bring you into the military of IS, um, or you can go to Mektab and Intisab. And it's notable that the, the, I have detailed forms that show just how, how it works and how you fill out the details. And, uh, you know, who gives you, you know, for example, one key element is you have to have, um, is, is uh, you have to have Tezkia or vouching from someone, so someone has to vouch for you and say, yeah, you're a good guy, you can, you can, you, you know, he, he, he's suitable for recruitment or, or for whatever. Um, also leaving guarantees on Imanat or something like, you know, like a phone or something. Um, so, you know, that's the, the bureaucracy of IS seeps into, in, into the recruitment structure uh, as well. Um, documents show the scheme goes that it's fifty dollars as your basic salary uh, per month and then it goes up by fifty dollars for each wife you have and then extra thirty five dollars a month for each child you have and what's interesting is that despite the different recruitment structures the same salary scheme applies whether you are an admin official or whether you are actually a soldier of IS. Um, it is true that fighters get benefits uh, for ex and they, they and other documents seem to show them as like a distinct class from the ordinary citizen body. So for example, one directive, all in last uh, October or so, I think it was October, uh, uh, ordered for the uh, um, uh, reduction in electricity access to fighters' homes, uh, partly on the basis of equity. Uh, thanks for these good questions. Um, so to your question as to um, how stable is, is IS governance, I think that we have definitely um, seen, uh, seen an erosion, um, uh, erosion yeah, sort of along two dimensions, only one of which I was able to touch on in the presentation. The first uh, in the ability of the organization to simply monitor and control its own lower ranking members and sort of officials. Um, the second, though, is, is what you suggest in terms of the constant aerial bombardment is, is the degrading of the actual infrastructure of governance. So certainly when you have constant um, aerial bombardment and you know, courts uh, and tax collection offices being bombed, that does um, significantly impact um, IS's ability to govern effectively. And so I think this is part of why um, we've seen both um, declines uh, in, in recruitment or IS's ability to, to attract people outside because um, the costs of, of joining or the cost of living in this area are simply increasing um, relative to whatever the perceived benefits are. Um, and it's also a big part of why we're seeing um, increases in uh, desertions and defections. Um, and then uh, to, the, to the second question as to sort of what kind of social contract this is, um, I, I think that, um, that, you know, although sort of the theories of social contract formation that we think about so often, um, locks, Hobbesian type contracts, um, uh, really come from sort of traditions of, of Western uh, liberalism. Um, I think there are many, many different kinds of social contracts. Um, there are uh, highly illiberal, um, authoritarian um, social contracts. And so um, you know, that's what I see the Um, sort of what type of law are we talking about? So, um, you know, I am sort of, in my research, I'm really trying to take seriously um, what IS considers to be law from its own internal perspective, um, which is a system uh, based on Sharia. Um, and IS, uh, as I uh, sort of
So, um, yeah, so certainly this is not an organization that is um, that recognizes this is not the law that all is going to engage um, at this level. <laughs> Thank you to all our speakers. Um, we're going to have a short tea break for about 15 minutes and then we'll have session five. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.